I'm recording this video the weekend after the election in which the Labour Party made a, such a total mess of its electoral programme uh, by its commitment to have a second referendum. But rather than talking about that, I thought I'd do a video on a basic piece of economics, the theory of absolute and relative surplus value in Marx's analysis of capitalism. Now, to those of you who have read Marx's Capital, these ideas should be fairly familiar, but I hope I can enrich them slightly by drawing on aspects of analysis which he presents in his drafts of Capital of 1861. Now, there are going to be two columns of related ideas here. The first relates to value analysis. And in these terms, the relevant concepts are absolute surplus value and relative surplus value. But there's another domain, which is the domain of technical analysis or analysis of the technical properties of the labor process. And in this, Marx equates absolute surplus value with what he calls the formal subordination or sometimes translated as the formal subsumption of labor to capital. And relative surplus value he equates to a different process which he calls the real subordination or real subsumption of labor to capital. Now what do these things mean? Well we're going to go through first looking at absolute surplus value. The basic idea in absolute surplus value is that when capitalism came into existence, it made people work longer than they had in pre-capitalist times. It forced them to work longer working days and to work more days in the year than they had as independent peasants. So let's have some idea of how long peasants work or did work. Some relatively recent figures done by a Japanese uh, social scientist looking at labour allocation of peasants in Java in recent years showed that on average <coughs> men worked six hours a day and women 2.7 hours a day. Now, he was only, or he or she, was only taking into account farm labour, labour which was to produce a crop, they weren't taking into account childcare and domestic labour which only produced something for the family. But even so, we can see that as a comparison with social labour done under capitalism, six hours or two and a half hours is not not very much. Now that's comparatively modern peasants in, in a rice agricultural system. What about Europe? Well one of the striking things is that peasant agriculture in Europe was carried out under conditions where the, there were lots of holidays. The Ancien Regime in France is reported to have guaranteed 52 Sundays off um, 90 rest days and 38 holidays. So the number of days actually working was comparatively small by modern standards. Figures for a casual labourer under pre-capitalist conditions in Britain in, in the 1400s, uh, in the 14th century, rather, not, 14, not in the year 1440. In the 14th century, it's reckoned they did around 1,400 hours a year. That's on the basis of the actual working year being 120 days a year. And that they worked from dawn to dusk 12 hours a day. Now, that's probably a bit of an exaggeration. But let's see how that changes. Once... Britain is capitalist, the average worker in the UK was working over 
3,100 hours a year. That's to say they were working 45 <coughs> a 45 week year in this case. Um, if we assume a 52 week year is probably more realistic, they would be doing 3,588 hours. And of course, they wouldn't be doing it under rural conditions. They'd be doing it under factory conditions of much more intense work. If 1,440 hours a year were enough to support a peasant, and if her descendant in a factory had to work 3,105 years hours a year, then the extra um, 1,600 or so hours could go to make profit for their employer. Because actually, until the late 19th century, workers in Britain were probably paid less than they had been in the 1400s. These extra hours that employees had to do are what Marx calls absolute surplus value. He calls it absolute surplus value because capitalism forced them to work absolutely longer. The image here is of the clock of the Singer sewing machine factory outside of Glasgow, which was one of the major employers of women's labour in Glasgow. Now, the first phase of capitalism, he says, there is only a formal subordination of labour to capital. He's, th I'm quoting now from his 1861 manuscript. I call the form which rests on absolute surplus value the formal subsumption of labour under capital because it is distinguished only formally from the earlier modes of production. The essential features of formal subsumption are these. There is a purely monetary relation between the person who is appropriating the surplus labour and the person who provides it. And two, the fact that the objective conditions of his labour, the means of production, and the subjective conditions of his labour, means of subsistence, confront him as capital, monopolised by the buyer of his labour power. So what he's saying is that in the early stages, before the employment of machinery, say in the uh, 1700s, people employed by capitalists were only formally subordinate to them. It was only a change in the social form of the labour. There's no change in the real mode of production. He continues, as yet there is no difference in the mode of production itself. The labour process, seen from the technological point of view, continues exactly as it did before, except now that it is a labour process subordinated to capital. So, for example, in the putting out system, uh, in the weaving trade, where the yarn was put out by merchant capitalists, worked on by workers at home, who then had the merchant capitalists take the, the woven uh, cloth and pay them for the labour they did producing it, this is still a situation where the actual machinery used, the actual tools used, are still hand-operated looms. And although these people are, are formally subordinated to the capitalists who control the trade, the real labour process remains the same. The important point is he's saying the mode of production itself doesn't change. So you can have capital formally subordinating labour before the capitalist mode of production comes into existence. And this is a very important point for people who are, for example, examining social relations in a country like India. You should not assume, or people should not assume, that where there is wage labour, you actually have the capitalist mode of production. 
you may have only a formal subordination of labour to capital. The real subsumption of labour to capital, he says, on this basis there arises a mode of production, the capitalist mode of production, which is specific technologically and in other ways and transforms the real nature of the labour process and its real conditions. Only when this enters the picture does the real subsumption of labour under capital take place. On the basis of this arises a new mode of production, which is spe technologically specific. The real subsumption of labour under capital is developed in all the forms which develop relative as distinct from absolute surplus value. So what he's saying is that relative surplus value is something specific to the capitalist mode of production, not specific to the formal wage-labour relation. Labour's social powers of production are developed, and with labour on a large scale, the application of science and machinery to direct production takes place. On the one hand, the capitalist mode of production, which now takes shape as a mode of production sui generis, changes the shape of material production. On the other hand, this alteration of production's material shape forms the basis for the development of the capital relation. Well, what he's saying is the application of machinery means that there is a really different mode of production. You have machine manufacture rather than manufacture. And this new physical mode of production develops the capital relation in that it's now impossible for the independent worker to take hold of the large machine like that steam engine. It can only be operated as part of a collective labour process driving hundreds of looms. What do we take away from this? The first point is that capitalist motor production is machine industry. That's what the capitalist motor production means. And this is the basis for the real subordination of labour to capital. It's real because the physical process of production is such that the workers can never afford to buy the means of production, nor could they individually operate them. And it's characterised by what he calls relative surplus value. And he calls it relative because the relative portions of the working day change the portions of the working day that constitute surplus and the portion of the working day that constitutes necessary time. Relative surplus value is generated when productivity rises faster than real wages. Then you get relative surplus value produced. And there's a well-known graph which has been circulating for some years now showing the rate of growth of productivity in the US, which is the upper line, and the rate of growth of real wages, and this gap between them is the relative surplus value that is being produced. And this is looking at total wages and salaries against output measured in money and then deflated by an inflation index. There is some controversy by Kleeman and people as to whether this real wage um, line was correctly deflated. I think it, uh, uh, we can disregard that controversy because other data shows that the real income per head for the bottom 50% of uh, the US working population has actually been stagnant. There hasn't actually been any rise for half of the US population. There's been no rise in real living standards since the late 1960s. They have hovered around the same level. Now this is basically what Marx assumes when dealing with relative surplus value. That real living standards remain stagnant and the growth in productivity then goes to the upper classes. And this is exactly what's happened. The, if we 
this is data taken from uh, Piketty's uh, database. If you look at the share of income going to the bottom 50% of the population, it's fallen from a around 20% in the late 60s to around 10% now. So the share of income going to the lower half of the working population has halved. So the labour content of the income of the median earner has halved due to rising productivity. On the other hand, look at this other line. This is the line showing the share of income of the top 1%. Over the same period, the share of value going to the top 1% has gone from 8% to just over 20%. Now think about that. That means that 1% of the population is now earning twice as much as 50% of the population. So their per capita income is now 100 times greater than the bottom half of the US population. This is a process that Marx called the general law of capitalist accumulation. He says it is establishes an accumulation of misery corresponding with the accumulation of capital. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is therefore at the same time accumulation of misery, agony of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality, mental degradation at the opposite pole. And this is what we see in the US. Increasing misery and degradation. The same process that Marx described in the 19th century continues from the, the mid-20th century down to now. And it's getting worse. And this is the process of production of relative surplus value. 